Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second in a series of three of the Reichauer Lectures for 2012. We have Professor Donald Lopez again this evening. Uh, last night, we were treated to a uh, lecture on the dissemination of the life story of the Buddha in Christian le legend in the form of the tale of Josephat and Barlam. And tonight, the title of the lecture is going to be The Unfortunate Idol Foe, The Story of a Forgotten Buddha. Uh, tonight's lecture will be followed by a response from Professor James Robeson, who is professor in the Department of East Asian and La Languages and Civilizations here. Uh, James Robeson specializes in the history of medieval Chinese Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, he has special interest in sacred geography, local religious history, talismans, and is currently engaged in a long-term collaborative research project on local religious statuary from Hunan province. And Professor Robeson is the author of a book called The Power of Place, the Religious Landscape of the Southern S Sacred Peak in Medieval China. So let me first um, welcome uh, Professor Donald Lopez again. Thank you, Janet, and thanks to all of you who came back for round two. Be a slight repetition uh, for anyone uh, who may be here for the first time today. Um, so these days, everyone likes the Buddha, but for much of the history of Europe's encounter with Buddhism, most Europeans did not like the Buddha, regarding him as a dangerous idol and an idol known by many names. Yesterday, I discussed one of the earliest encounters between Buddhism and Christianity, in which the life of the Buddha was incorporated into the story of a Christian saint. However, this portrayal of the Buddha occurred unwittingly. Only in the 19th century was it finally discovered that Saint Josephat was really Saint Bodhisattva. The theme of mistaken identity runs throughout the long history of Europe's encounter with Buddhism. And this afternoon, I would like to examine three early European accounts of the Buddha from the 16th and 17th centuries, one from China, one from Thailand, and one from Vietnam. In none of the cases was he called the Buddha. Thus, for the title of this lecture, I've chosen the name that Leibniz used for him. He called him in Felix Fo Idolum, the unfortunate idol foe. Today's lecture has the same epigraph as yesterday's. It comes from Marco Polo. After his years of service to the great Khan, he sailed home to Venice. His ship made port in Sri Lanka, probably in 1292. In his account of the island, Marco Polo describes the mountain that is known as Adam's Peak. And please forgive the repetition. He writes, furthermore, you must know that in the island of Ceylon, there is an exceeding high mountain. It rises right up so steep and precipitous that no one could ascend it were it not that they have taken and fixed to it several great and massive iron chains so deposed that by the help of these, men are able to mount to the top. And I tell you that on this mountain is the sepulcher of Adam, our first parent. At least that is what the Saracens say. But the idolaters say that it is the sepulcher of Sagamoni Borkan, before whose time there were no idols. They hold him to, to, to have been the best of men, a great saint in fact, according to their fashion, and the first in whose name idols were made. It seems strange that Marco Polo would describe the Buddha as the first in whose name idols were made. Is he claiming that idols of the Buddha preceded those said to have been made by Eber, great-grandson of Noah's son Shem, or by Serug, great-grandfather of Abraham, that there were idols of the Buddha before the idols of the Egyptians and before the golden calf? Did Marco Polo not know the, king, the story of King Asa, retold by Melville and Moby Dick? Quote, such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Maka in Judea, and for the worshiping which King Asa, her son, did depose her and destroy the idol and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kidrom as darkly set forth in the 15th chapter of the first book of Kings. Rather than referring to biblical history, however, Marco Polo is likely alluding to a story that he would have heard in China. It is said that the Emperor Ming of the Han Dynasty, who reigned between 58 and 75 CE, had a dream 
in which he saw a golden being flying in front of his palace, emitting rays of light from the top of its head. The next day, the emperor asked his ministers who the spirit might be, and one of them replied that he'd heard that there was a sage in the West called Buddha who had attained the way, the Tao, and was able to fly. The emperor dispatched a de delegation in search of this sage. Arriving finally in the Tarim Basin in Central Asia, they acquired a copy of a work called the Sutra in 42 Sections, which they presented to the emperor. Ironically, this would be the first Buddhist text to be translated or attempt to be translated into European language by Joseph de Guinée in 1759. A fifth century source reports that during their journey, the delegation also acquired the famous Udayana, Ud Udayana image of the Buddha. According to legend, the first image of the Buddha ever made, one for which the Buddha himself had posed. This statue is said, to, said then to be the prototype for all future Buddha images. Hence Marco Polo's reference to the first in whose name idols were made. Several centuries after Marco Polo, the French Jesuit missionary to China, Louis, Louis Lacan, offered a somewhat less laudatory version of the same story, referring to the Buddha by his, Christ, by his Chinese name, Fu. In the Tang Dynasty, this character that today is pronounced Fu is, was pronounced Bud. So after describing what we today call Confucianism, Lacan writes, and I quote, the second sect which is prevalent in China and is more dangerous and more universally spread than the former, adore an idol which they call Fo or Foe, as the only god of the world. This idol was brought from the Indies two and 30 years after the death of Jesus Christ. This poison began at court, but spread its infection through all the provinces and corrupted every town, so that this great body of men, already spoiled by magic and impiety, was immediately infected with idolatry and became a monstrous receptacle for all sorts of errors. Fables, superstitions, transmigration of souls, idolatry and atheism divided them and got so strong a mastery over them that even at this present, there is no so great impediment to the progress of Christianity as is this ridiculous and impious doctrine. Thus the devil making use of men's folly and malice for their destruction endeavors to erase out of the minds of some those excellent ideas of God which are so deeply engraved there and to imprint in the minds of others the worship of false gods under the shapes of a multitude of different creatures for they did not stop at the worship of this idol. The ape, the elephant, the dragon had been worshiped in several places under the pretense perhaps that the god foe had, success, had successively been transmigrated into these creatures. China, the most superstitious of all nations, increased the number of her idols, and one may now see all sorts of them in the temples which serve to abuse the folly of this people. Matteo Ricci arrived in Macau in 1582. The founder of the Jesuit missionary in China was his colleague, Michele Ruggieri. Father Ruggieri had established good relations with the governor general of Guangdong and Guangxi provinces, who suggested that the Christian fathers dress in the garb of Buddhist monks. Europeans in Asia often remarked that Buddhist monks looked like Catholic priests. It seems that the Chinese thought that Catholic priests looked like Buddhist monks. And from the Chinese perspective, the similarities were not simply superficial. Both Catholic priests and Buddhist monks were celibates who taught a foreign religion that had come from the West. And so the Jesuits cropped their hair and shaved off their beards and donned the robes of Buddhist monks, providing themselves with visible markers that would be understood in China. It is likely, in fact, that they were initially regarded as Buddhists, an impression reinforced by the plaque on their residence in the city of Jiajing that read Pure Land of the West, a term that would evoke for the Chinese, of course, the Pure Land of the Buddha Amitabha. They were referred to by the Chinese as Hashang and Sung, two terms for Buddhist monks, and the priests introduced themselves as Buddhist monks from India and as Buddhist monks from the Western Pure Land, perhaps leaving ambiguous whether this referred to Amitabha's heaven or the street address of their house in Jiajing. In 1595, at the urging of his Chinese scholar friends and with the permission of his superior, Ricci and the Jesuits abandoned the dress of Buddhist monks, whom he reports the Chinese held as vile and lowly for the long beard and silk robes of the Chinese literatus. 
From that point on, Ricci, Ricci's slogan was, Chinru Paifo, draw close to Confucianism, repudiate Buddhism. In 1603, Ricci condemned Buddhism in his catechism written in Chinese entitled The Two True Doctrine of the Lord of Heaven. No longer wishing to be mistaken for a Buddhist monk, he argued that the very presence of Buddhism in China was a case of mistaken identity. He recounts the famous story of the dream of the Emperor Ming and the delegation sent to the West to retrieve the teachings of the Golden Man. And describing Jesus, Matteo Ricci writes, quote, when his work of preaching was complete, he ascended to heaven in broad daylight at a time forecast by himself. Four saints recorded the deeds he had performed whilst on earth, as well as his teachings. These were transmitted to many countries and large numbers of people from all quarters believed in him, keeping his commandments from one generation to another. From this time onwards, many nations in the West took great strides along the road to civilization. He goes on, when we examine Chinese history, we find that Emperor Ming of the Han Dynasty heard of these events and sent ambassadors on a mission to the West to search for the canonical writings. Midway, these ambassadors mistakenly took India to be their goal and returned to China with Buddhist scriptures, which were then circulated throughout, throughout the nation. From then until now, the people of your esteemed country have been deceived and misled. That they have not heard the correct way is truly a great tragedy for the field of learning. Was it not a disaster? Thus, it had all been a mistake. The emperor's dream, in fact, foretold the coming of Christ to China, not the coming of the Buddha from India. The Christian missionaries were therefore carrying out the emperor's instructions as his own envoys had not, by bringing the teachings of the golden man from the West to China. Furthermore, any similarity that the Chinese might discern between Buddhism and Christianity, such as the fact that both assert the existence of heaven and hell, was, according to Ricci, the result of a more willful error, and he writes. Things may be similar in one or two respects, yet quite different in reality. The religion of the Lord of Heaven is a very ancient religion, and Shakyamuni lived in the West. He must secretly have heard of this teaching. Anyone wishing to promote his own school of thought must insert two or three elements of orthodoxy into it, otherwise no one will believe him. Shakyamuni borrowed the doctrines concerning the Lord of Heaven and Heaven and Hell from us in order to promote his private views and heterodox teachings. We transmit the correct way. Elsewhere in his text, Ricci describes the Buddha as a small man who, illumined by the light of the Lord of Heaven, possessed some talent. But he became arrogant and boastful, feeling that he was a, as worthy of worship as God himself, teaching such benighted doctrines as reincarnation and the prohibition against killing animals. If the Lord of Heaven did not want men to kill animals for food, Ricci argues, why did he make their flesh taste so good? <laughs> a question we've all asked ourselves, I'm sure. In the 17th century, accounts of the life of the Buddha more detailed than that provided by Marco Polo that I talked about yesterday began to appear. These accounts, often by missionaries, in other cases by diplomats and other various and sundry travelers, did not derive from the direct translation of Buddhist texts, but rather from oral reports, likely received with varying degrees of oral proficiency. Thus, the envoy of Louis XIV to the King of Siam in 1687 complains, quote, "'Tis no fault of mine that they give me not the life of Soma the Kodom, translated from their books, but not being able to obtain it, I will here relate what was told me thereof." He then goes on to provide a fairly lengthy account of the life of the Buddha, or Samona Kodom, as he calls him, including the following. "'Tis said that he bestowed all his estate in alms, and that his charity not being yet satisfied, he plucked out his eyes and slew his wife and children to give them to the talipoins of his age to eat." There is a strange contrariety of ideas in this people, he continues, who prohibit nothing so much as to kill, yet who relate the most execrable parasites as the most meritorious works of Simona Kodom. In this passage, by the way, talipoin uh, is a term used by the Europeans, first by the Portuguese, then the French, then more generally to refer to a Buddhist monk, uh, especially of the Theravada tradition. The French claim that the name derived from the palm leaf fan that monks often carried called talapat. However, it claims to derive from an old Burmese form of a form of address to a monk, uh, talapoi, my lord. 
At any rate, the French author here is the diplomat Simon de la Lubert. And he expresses his dismay at not receiving a full translation of the life of Simon de Codom. And by the way, Simon de Codom is a, his pronunciation of the Thai version of a standard epithet of the Buddha, uh, Samana Gautama, the, the ascetic Gautama. Uh, so Lubert presents a rather muddled version, apparently confusing the life of the Buddha with the famous story of Prince Vesantara, in fact, the Buddha in a previous life who displayed his remarkable generosity by giving away his wife and children. Uh, in Lubert's version, he first kills them and then feeds them to monks. That does not occur in the Buddhist text. <laughs> uh, reading uh, de la Lubert's uh, Wayam de Siam, published in Paris and Amsterdam in 1691, two years later in English as a new historical relation of the, King of Siam, of the Kingdom of Siam, one is struck by the fact that his description of the life of the Buddha is only one third as long as his description of the life of someone he calls Tevatat, that is Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin. The reason derives from perhaps the most consequential case of mistaken identity in the history of the European encounter with Buddhism. So in stories of the life of the Buddha, there are two villains, one divine, one human. The divine villain is Mara, the Buddhist deity of desire and death. It is Mara who attacks the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, trying to prevent his achievement of Buddhahood. It is Mara who extracts from the Buddha the promise to enter nirvana when his work is done, rather than live for an aeon or till the end of the aeon. The human villain is in many ways a more interesting figure. He is Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin. After his enlightenment, the Buddha returned to his home city of Kapilavastu, where he preached the Dharma to his family and kinsmen. Several of his relatives joined the order of monks, including two of his cousins, Ananda, who would eventually become the Buddha's personal attendant and one of the most beloved figures in the history of Buddhism, and Devadatta, who would become the Buddha's chief antagonist and one of the most reviled figures in the history of Buddhism. According to the legends of the Buddha's previous lives, the famous Jataka's tales, Devadatta's animus toward the Buddha extended back over many lifetimes because we see at the end of so many of the stories, uh, the Buddha identifies the characters from the past uh, with some of his contemporaries. So the hero of the story is typically the Buddha in a former life. His companions in the story are uh, Ananda and Shariputra typically, and the villain in the, in, the, in the former life is often Devadatta. Yet in accounts that may date back from a period closer to actual events, Devadatta is a much more complicated figure. He became a monk when the Buddha returned to his home city after his enlightenment, according to some accounts, just one year after his enlightenment, and seems to have been a dedicated monk for several decades. It is only when the Buddha grew old that the trouble began. Eight years before the Buddha's passage into Nirvana, Devadatta went to the Buddha and suggested that in light of the Buddha's advanced age, he was 72 years old at the time, leadership of the order of monks should be turned over to him. In front of the entire assembly of monks, Devadatta rose, threw his upper robe over his shoulder, approached the Buddha, and with, and with his palms joined as a sign of respect, said, Lord, the blessed one is now old, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. Let the blessed one now rest. Let him dwell in bliss in the present life. Let him hand over the order of monks to me. I will govern the order of monks. The Buddha refused. However, as Devadatta well knew, the Buddha often refused a first request only to agree the third time. When Devadatta asked the third time, the Buddha again refused saying, why would I turn over the order to a clot of spittle like you? Smarting from this public humiliation, Devadatta sought revenge and plotted to assassinate the Buddha. He first hired 16 archers to kill him, but the Buddha ended up converting each one of them. <laughs> Next, Devadatta decided to kill the Buddha himself, pushing a large boulder down Vulture Peak as the Buddha was walking back and forth in its shade. Two large outcroppings miraculously rose out of the mountainside to block its path, but a splinter of the rock broke off and struck the Buddha's toe, causing it to bleed. And it said the fact that the Buddha was injured at all in this incident 
was a, the residual effect of his having, in a previous life, murdered his brother in order to inherit the family fortune. Devadatta tried a third time to murder the Buddha, this time sending a mad elephant to trample him. But when he reached the Buddha, the elephant knelt before him, and the Buddha stroked its head, a scene widely depicted in Buddhist art. Unable to kill the Buddha, Devadatta determined to win the allegiance of the order of monks. And so he recommended that all monks should follow five rules. Number one, they should live their entire lives in the forest and not in villages. Number two, they should live entirely on the alms they receive from begging and should not accept invitations to dine in the homes of the laity. Number three, they should only wear robes made from discarded rags and should not accept offerings of cloth for robes from the laity. Number four, they should dwell at the foot of a tree and never under a roof. And finally, they should not eat fish or meat. Hearing of this, the Buddha declared that any monk who wished to obey these rules, apart from living under a tree during the rainy season, was free to do so, but he would not declare these practices to be obligatory. Devadatta then denounced the Buddha for being lax in the practice of asceticism, apparently gaining a substantial following of newly ordained monks who departed with Devadatta but they were quickly persuaded to return. Devadatta vomited blood at the news of their desertion. Knowing his end was near, he set off to see the Buddha one last time. According to some accounts, he was sincerely contrite. According to others, he smeared his fingernails with poison for one last assassination attempt. As he rested at the shore of a pond where he'd stopped to bathe, he was slowly swallowed by the earth first his feet, then his knees, then his chest, then his neck, and when only his head remained and his jawbone touched the ground, his, he declared his final words, with these bones and with these vital airs, I seek refuge in the Buddha, preeminent among men, god of gods, charioteer of untamed humanity, all seen, endowed with the auspicious marks of a hundred virtues. But he disappeared, descending into Avicii, where he suffered a horrible fate. The Avicii, Avicii means incessant. The Avicii hell is the most horrific of the 16 Buddhist hells, eight hot, eight cold. It is located at the greatest distance from beneath, the, beneath the surface of the earth with the longest lifespan and the most terrible sufferings. In the other Buddhist hells, the denizens undergo various forms of gruesome torture, but here their bodies simply become indistinguishable from fire that never goes out, and all that remains is their voice. And according to Buddhist doctrine, there are five deeds called the deeds of immediate retribution that cause one to be reborn in Avicii immediately without an intervening lifetime elsewhere, and they are killing one's father, killing one's mother, killing an arhat, wounding the Buddha, and causing dissension in the community of monks. Devadatta committed the fourth and fifth of these. Right? He wounded the Buddha, causing, uh, sorry, with blood flowing from the Buddha's toe. He caused dissension in the monastic community. And because he also convinced the Prince Ajatashatru to, to murder his father, the pious King Bimbisara, he indirectly also committed the first, killing one's father. And his wounding of the Buddha really resulted from an attempt to kill him, and the Buddha was an arhat. So uh, from a certain sense, the Devadatta had committed four of the five deeds. And so he suffered a particularly horrible fate. Once in hell, his body grew to be 100 leagues tall, such that his head touched the top of the vast chamber of Avicii, and his feet sunk up to his ankles in its surface of solid iron. His head was then placed inside an iron helmet that held him, held him motionless. And then, as the commentary to the Dhammapada explains, an iron stake as thick as the trunk of a palmyra tree proceeded forth from the west wall of the iron shell and pierced the small of his back, came forth from his breast, and penetrated the east wall. Another iron stake proceeded forth from the south wall, pierced his right side, came forth from his left side, and penetrated the north wall. Another iron stake proceeded forth from the top of the iron skull, pierced his skull, came forth from his lower parts, and penetrated the earth of iron. In this position, immovable, he suffers this mode of torture. And so Devadatta is thus impaled for aeons, unable to move, as the text says, since he sinned against an unchanging Buddha, let him endure tor torture unchangingly. 
And indeed, we find an accurate rending of the, of the infernal state of Devadatta in uh, Delubert's Wayam de Siam, in a section entitled The Life of Tevatat, translated from the Bali, B-A-L-I-E, that is Pali, the canonical language of Theravada Buddhism, in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. In, in his account, Devadatta becomes Tevatat, Avici is Eveti, and the Buddha is Samona Kodom, but otherwise the rendition is actually quite faithful, and it, and it reads as follows. Meanwhile, Tevatat was buried in the earth and even to hell where he is without possibility of removing for want of having loved Samona Kodom. His body is the height of a jod, that is to say, 8,000 fathoms. He is in the hell of Vete, 650 leagues in greatness. On his head, he has a great iron pot all red with fire, which came to his shoulders. He has his feet sunk into the earth up to the ankles and all inflamed. Moreover, a great iron spit, which reaches from the west to the east, pierces through his shoulders and come out, comes out his breast. Another pierces him through the sides, which comes from the south and goes to the north and crosses all of hell. And another enters inside through his head and pierces him to the feet. Now all these spits do stick at both ends, and they are thrust a great way into the earth. He is standing without being able to stir or lie down." End quote. But why did the French legation to the court of Siam, why were they so interested in the story of Devadatta? Alexander Chevalier de Chaumont was the first ambassador sent by Louis XIV to Siam. In his account of the embassy of 1685, he briefly described the religion of Siam referring here to the Buddha as Nakodon, apparently an abbreviation of Samondo Kodom. And he says, quote, the last of these three telepoins is the greatest god called Nakodon, because he has been in 5,000 bodies. In one of these transmigrations of telepoin, he became a cow. His brother would have killed him several times, but there needs a great book to describe the miracles which they say nature and not God wrought for his preservation. In short, his brother was thrown into hell for his great sins, where Nakadong caused him to be crucified. And for this foolish reason, they abominate the image of Christ on the cross, saying that we adore the image of this brother of their God who was crucified for his crimes. The Chevalier was accompanied by two priests, the Abbe de Choisy and the Jesuit uh, Guy Tachard. Father Tachard provides a detailed description of the life of the Buddha in the course of which he laments this connection with Devadatta. Though there be many things that keep the Siamese at a distance from the Christian law, yet one may say nothing makes them more averse from it than this thought, the similitude that is to be found in some points betwixt their religion and ours, making them believe that Jesus Christ is the very same with that Devatat mentioned in their scriptures, they are persuaded that seeing we are, we are disciples of the one, that we are also followers of the other. And the fear they have of falling into hell with Devadat, if they follow his doctrine, suffers them not to hearken to the propositions that are made to them of embracing Christianity. That which most confirms them in their prejudice is that we adore the image of our crucified savior, which plainly re represents the punishment of Devadat. So when we would explain to them the articles of our faith, they take us up always short, saying that we do not, that they do not need our instructions, that they know already better than we do what we have in mind to tell them. And so Simone de Lubert asked for and received a Pali account of the life of Devadatta, which he had translated into French. Giving new meaning to the enemy of my enemy is my friend, the French may have felt that they might have learned something from the life of the antagonist of the Buddha as they themselves sought to save the Siamese from perdition and convert them from idolatry to the true faith. The Thai Buddhists at court must have immediately been struck by the fact that the French priests were wearing little statues of Devadatta around their necks. But even if the most famous case of crucifixion in Buddhism had not involved the monk who tried to murder the Buddha, Buddhists would have likely found it odd that anyone would honor a being who'd suffered such a fate. <laughs> what horrible deed could such a being have committed to, to deserve that punishment as its karmic effect? And if, he were being, and if he were a being worthy of worship, why did he lack the powers to escape the cross? At that early point in the history of Buddhist-Christian dialogue, it is unlikely that the fine points of the theology of the Lamb of God 
could have been conveyed effectively from French into Thai. Those who came from Europe wearing crucifixes around their necks would declare the teachings of the Buddha to be a lie, insisting that Buddhists reject them and worship the one who had suffered the fate of Devadatta. But the mistaken identity of Devadatta with Jesus proved so vexing to the missionaries that they would eventually claim that the entire story of Devadatta was not original to Buddhism, but had been, con had been concocted by the Buddhists after the arrival of the Portuguese in 1498 in an effort to prevent conversion to the Roman Catholic faith. This idea persisted into the 19th century. Thus, we read the following in a footnote in an important essay called On the Religion and Literature of the Burmas, published in Asiatic Researches in 1801 by the Scottish physician Francis Buchanan himself, no friend of the Roman Catholic Church. And he reports, a Siamese painter told me that David Dutt, or as he, or as he pronounced it, Tevatut was the god of the Pai Gai, or of the British. And he conceived that it is he who, by opposing the good intentions of Goldama, produces all the evil in the world. I'm inclined to believe that the legend of Tevatut, of which Monsieur Lubert has given us a translation, has been composed since the arrival of the Portuguese in India, in order to prevent the propagation of their religion, so well adapted in its splendor and mysteries to gain the belief of an ignorant people. The final mistake that I would like to discuss this afternoon occurs in the account of yet another remarkable Jesuit, Cristoforo Bori, missionary to, the, to Cochin, China, in what is today Vietnam. What he describes is not so much a mistake, but a willful misrepresentation. In his account of the religion of Cochin, China, we find one of the most beautiful and least polemical accounts of the Buddha in the vast literature of the missionaries. Here the Buddha is not Fo or some other Kodom, but Zaka, X-A-C-A. And let me read his passage. The end of all sects is either the God they adore or the glory and happiness they expect. Some believing in the immortality of the soul, others concluding that all ends when the body dies. Upon these two principles, the Eastern nations build all their sects, all which took their origin from a great metaphysician of the kingdom of Siam, whose name was Zaka, much more ancient than Aristotle and nothing inferior to him in capacity and the knowledge of natural things. The acuteness of this man's wit, exciting him to consider the nature and fabric of the world, reflecting on the beginning and end of all things, and particularly of human nature, he once went up to the top of a mountain and there attentively observing the moon, which rising in the darkness of the night, gently raised itself above the horizon to be hit again the next day in the same darkness, and the sun rising in the morning to set again at night, he concluded that moral as well as physical and natural things were nothing, came of nothing and ended in nothing. Therefore, Returning home, he wrote several books and large volumes on the subject, entitling them Of Nothing, wherein he taught that the things of this world, by reason of the duration and measure of time, are nothing. For though they had existence, said he, yet they would be nothing, nothing at present and nothing in the time to come, for the present being but a moment was the same as nothing. Having established this doctrine of nothing, he gathered some scholars by whose means he spread it throughout all the East. But the Chinese, who knew that in a, who knew that such a sect that it's but the Chinese, who knew that a sect which reduced all things to nothing was hurtful to government, would not hearken to it, nor allow there was no punishment for wicked men, or that the happiness of the good should be reduced only to being free from sufferings in this world. And the authority of the Chinese being so great, others following their example rejected his doctrine. Zaka, dissatisfied that he was disappointed to followers, changed his mind and retiring, wrote several other great books teaching that there was a real origin of all things, a Lord of heaven, hell, immortality, and transmigration of souls from one body to another 
better or worse, according to the merits or demerits of the person, though they do not forget to assign a sort of heaven and hell for the souls of the departed, expressing the whole metaphorically under the names of things corporeal and of the joys and sufferings of this world. The Japanese and others making so great account of this opinion of nothing was the cause that when Zaka, the author of it, approached his death, calling together his disciples, he protested to them on the word of, the dying, of a dying man that during the many years he'd lived and studied, he'd found nothing so true nor any opinion so well grounded as was the sect of nothing. And though his second doctrine seemed to differ from it, yet they must look upon it as no contradiction or recantation, but rather a proof and confirmation of the first, though not in plain terms, yet by ways of metaphors and parables, which might all be applied to the opinion of nothing as would plainly appear by his books. This is a remarkable passage, both in its tone as well as its content. It explains that Zaka, not a demon, not an idol, but a philosopher to rival Aristotle himself, developed his doctrine of nothingness, which he describes in much more detail than I've presented here, in his native Siam. But when he took it to China, the Chinese objected that it was hurtful to government. Thus, Zaka devised a more conventional doctrine that included the things that the Jesuits most commonly associated with Buddhism, in addition to idol worship, the system of transmigration of souls based on virtuous and sinful deeds. Zaka then apparently continued to Japan, where he found the Japanese more amenable to his original doctrine of nothing. And thus, as he lay dying, he declared that it was his true teaching and that his subsequent accommodation in his second doctrine should be understood metaphorically. There is much to ponder here. Issues of truth and falsity, of accommodation and condemnation of the original and the copy appeared yet again in a Jesuit mission less famous than those of Francis Xavier to Japan, Matteo Ricci to China, and Gita Shard de Siam. It's the mission of Ippolito Desideri to Tibet to which we will turn tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Lopez, for this uh, very stimulating talk filled with uh, some incredible stories. Um, I thought it might be helpful to uh, situate uh, uh, Professor Lopez's uh, the last two lectures uh, in the context, a slightly larger context of some recent scholarship uh, for those who may not be deeply involved in Buddhist studies. Uh, he alluded this, uh, to this yesterday, uh, but it is important to note that um, uh, perhaps a decade ago, uh, much uh, recent scholarship from Schwab's monumental uh, or Oriental Renaissance to Philip Allman's British Discovery of Buddhism to even more recent works had put the Western discovery of Buddhism in the 19th century. So importantly now, Professor Lopez is pushing the inquiries back even further into the 18th century. And that is important, I think, for the context of what we're uh, going to be learning along the way. In today's lecture, Professor Lopez has given us three very striking, evocative, and even memorable images of missteps in the European encounter with Buddhism during the 16th and 17th centuries in three locales in Asia, China, Thailand, Vietnam. If yesterday's lecture focused on issues of forgetting and oblivion, and the historian's task was of picking through the refuse for the forgotten, then this lecture shifts to a discussion of three forms of misidentification or misunderstandings, terms that I'll return to in a moment, that were done by missionaries, Emperor Ming's dream, Devadatta as Jesus, and the exoteric versus esoteric teaching related to nothingness or emptiness doctrine. In Emperor Ming dream, Ming's dream, the Jesuits themselves were first regarded as Buddhist, visually based on their dress and linguistically based on the names uh, for them, Sung and Hushang, and the use of the term India, Tianzhu, for where they came from. The Jesuits, as we all know, came to throw off the Buddhist robes and to don those of the literatus and Confucianism, grow their, here, their hair and their beards. Ricci, hoping to show how Buddhism was just a mistake itself, reinterprets the story of Emperor Ming's dream 
The dream referred to the coming of Christ, but the emissary stopped short of Europe and merely brought back Buddhist idolatry. Note that in, an addi in addition to a text, a statue was also brought back. Thus, Buddhism is sometimes referred to as Xiangjiao, referring to these images. He could then sell the missionary's case as being a fulfillment of the, of the emperor's initial instructions, which was to restore the ancient past of this true religion. During the 17th and early uh, 18th century, there were in fact some who believed that descendants of Noah had transmitted monotheism to China and India post-flood. In China, the Jesuit figurists were determined to discover vestiges of Noahic religion in ancient Chinese texts. The early idea was that monotheism was preserved uh, both in, in China and also in India in the Vedas, but it was kept secret by the Brahmins who taught the masses polytheism. The discovery of monotheism in India may have been one root cause for the shift of European interest from China to India in the 18th century. The emphasis on Indian monotheism was often more about a critique of degenerate European Christians, and we see this already in somebody like Voltaire. An interesting aside here uh, is on how uh, this looking to China actually caught for this early Noahic religion that was preserved there caused a problem of chronology for Europeans since it became clear that Chinese civilization predated Western datings of the flood. So how were they to reconcile this? The Jesuits pushed for using a longer chronology and others were more creative and in 1678 a missionary proposed that Noah had lived in China prior to the deluge and built the ark with the advanced technology of the Chinese. Uh, this was the idea that the resources were there, the labor force and the uh, technology. In my view, uh, I don't know if Professor Lopez reads the historical record in the same way, uh, this is all part of a longer story or theory that sees the development of idolatry and profanation arriving into China and India with Egyptian colonialists. Evi the evidence is that we, for this claim, is that we find metempsychosis or the transmigration of souls in both places. Uh, and so this, uh, it, it, it arrives and uh, gets developed along with Buddhism then. Indeed, one of the figures he mentions, uh, Joseph de Gauguin, who ha had actually also worked on the Rosetta Stone and had speculated that Egyptians must have colonized China since the Chinese also used pictographic script. So, put that, that one aside and move on to Devadatta. This darker story of the Buddha that began to circulate in the 17th century the one who killed his wife and children. Here we find a Frenchman hearing a story and mistaking it as the Buddha's biography. And then mistaking, uh, the mistaking of stories about Devadatta, who is the evil and villainous cousin of the Buddha, as those of, of the Buddha himself. Professor Lopez then asks why the French legation in Thailand was so interested in the story, and this is where it gets most interesting. 17th century European stories describe Devadatta as being crucified by the Buddha just like Jesus on the crucifix, such that the Thai reluctance to accept Christianity is in large part due to a, a perception that the Christian worship the Buddhist villain Devadatta, and even worse, they wear this crucified figure around their necks, he says. Their experiments in using that story uh, as a means of proselytization came to an end as they came to propose that the story was in fact invented by the Buddhists who were trying to prevent Catholic conversion in India. Lopez's treatment of Devadatta as Jesus is very intriguing indeed, and it seems not to have ended since the famous theosophist Madame Blavatsky reported in the 19th century that the theory was still to be found in Burma. I have really nothing more to add here about this except to say it's a fascinating story uh, and one uh, wishes that more could be written on this, and I, I, I look forward to learning more about it along the way. The last part of his talk on the eso exoteric and ex esoteric teaching related to nothingness or emptiness doctrine uh, is integral to the last part of his talk. It's a fascinating account of the misrepresentation of the Buddhist philosophy of emptiness, or as the Europeans called it, the philosophy of nothing as a teaching that was rejected and replaced by standard Buddhist teachings in the uh, subsequent uh, texts that were distributed. In my thinking about this, this portion of his talk and the section on nothingness, it shows another important factor involving the European context for understanding how they encountered and understood Buddhism, 
And that was the notion that if polytheism was bad, atheism was even worse. Consider the following account from another missionary of the 16th century that must, I think, be connected to the story by Bori that Professor Lopez relates, and I quote, at the age of 79, this newly manufactured god felt that he was not among the immortals, sensed that his powers were waning, and knew that his hour had come. Never had anybody been more pernicious for humankind. Already on the verge of death, he vomited forth the foul poison of atheism, and, as one might expect, openly confessed that during more than 40 years of his preaching, he had not told the truth to the world and had concealed the naked truth under the veil of metaphorical teachings by way of figures, analogies, and parables, but that now, as he approached death, it was time to declare its arcane meaning. There is nothing to be sought and nothing to pin our hopes on other than vacuity and emptiness, called uh, kum hu, or he must be kong shu by the Chinese, which is the principle of all things, he says. These are the last words of this horrible imposter, and they constitute the principal root of atheism, a root that even today is lurking in the murkiness of falsehood and superstitions as if buried underground, which is why it escapes the attention of ignorant people, end of quote. This text spread like wildfire throughout Europe, it was quoted in numerous book reviews uh, and essays and is found in Diderot, and the philosophy of emptiness ultimately became enshrined in Hegel's Encyclopedia of Philosophy in 1830. In other words, the discovery and description of Buddhism in East Asia and Asia was a fertile ground to fight battles about religion that have roots going all the way back to Europe. The Buddha then was a kind of a puppet held in the Jesuit ventriloquist hands as they filled his mind with ideas and his mouth with words to support the view that, ins that insisted on the necessity of divine revelation and labeled Chinese religions as atheistic. Jesuits, for obvious reasons, tried to suppress this account and adopt Ritchie's strategy, which was that ancient Chinese religion was a natural religion whose monotheism was independent of revelation and therefore purely rational. But the text leaked out to Europe, and to add irony upon irony, it later became the touchstone, the touchstone, uh, touchstone text for a positive evaluation of emptiness doctrine along the lines of Spinoza's teaching. So it actually re-comes in to bolster that opinion. Those are the main topics discussed by Professor Lopez, and they're well chosen for his purposes. If we were to throw the net even wider, to include other forms of misidentification, mistaken identity, or misrepresentation, one could cite any number of examples from East Asia, and a few that come to mind would be the famous Huahu controversy or the conversion of the barbarians, the idea that Taoists developed the Huahu Jing to support one of their favorite arguments against the Buddhist, which was their claim that Lao Tzu had gone to India after his westward departure from China and had converted or become the Buddha. Buddhism then was only a somewhat distorted offshoot of Taoism, and in order that they might die out in China, he made uh, them to teach a doctrine of celibacy, so that they would eventually just uh, no longer propagate. Uh, some missionaries also thought that Bodhidharma, or in the Chinese pronunciation, Da Mo or Ta Mo in Chinese, was in fact the Apostle Thomas. And we know that some traditions claim that Thomas had made his way to India, and this appears in many stories. One of my personal favorite accounts of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, misidentification, all wrapped into one, is the Japanese story of the role of the interpreter named Anjiro, who became the main informer and translator who advised Jesuit missionaries in Japan. He informed them that the founder of the Japanese religion hailed from a place called Tenjiku, or Tianju, which unbeknownst to him referred to India, and so when Jesuits arrived in Japan, they were called Tenjikujin, or Tianjuren, and they were overrun by Buddhist monks who came knocking on their doors wanting information about that land and the teachings that they had. The Jesuits explained, thanks to the advice of Anjiro, that in that land the people believed in Dainichi, the Japanese term for the cosmic Buddha Vairochana. So God was Dainichi, or Vairochana, the cosmic Buddha. Francis Xavier reports that some missionaries in the 16th century would run through the streets yelling, Dainichi o Ogameare, or pray to Dainichi, 
And, Je and Jesuit preaching on heaven and hell sounded perfectly familiar to these Japanese from the Buddhist accounts. These Jesuits were Buddhists, like in China. And even wor worst, perhaps, was uh, the fact that later the term that they used for God, Dainichi, had become a slang term used to refer to a woman's sexual organ. Things just got worse from there. <laughs> when they thought that they would go back to the Latin to be safe, and this raises the issue of the problem of both translation and, and transliteration, so they go back to the Latin and decide to use the term deus, which in Japanese becomes daiuso, or the great lie. So this uh, problem uh, got fur compounded further, even in, obviously, the role of language in all of this has comparable accounts in China. So what is the lesson in all of this for us as scholars or for the field? Professor Lopez does not explicitly reflect on this question, but I detect that underlying these stories and evocative accounts, that there's something larger at stake. The main methodological question that arises in my, my mind on reflecting on his talk is the following. Are we witnessing a series of purposeful misreadings, intentional distortions, or is it more a matter of historical accidents and willful ignorance? And who is in control of the various representations, those peddling their wares in a particular way or those appropriating things in particular ways? Are we in an interpretive position not too unlike that marked out in the now famous debate between Marshall Solins and Gananath Obiseakre over the status of Captain Cook as the Hawaiian god or Chief Lono? Perhaps it is not an either-or question, and Professor Lopez seems to move between these two options. Perhaps it is time we try to take seriously these types of cultural mistakes, misunderstandings, and mistaken identities. There's not time enough to go deeply into this here, but the issue of misunderstanding or not understanding has, in my opinion, had a bad rap. Misunderstanding, by the very logic of the concept, can be envisaged neither as the goal nor as the result of scientific work. Even those who maintain that falsification, not verification, is all that science can accomplish, and those who state that all interpretation is partial, strive for some kind of positive gain in knowledge. In presentations of historic or even anthropological knowledge, misunderstandings may be focused on and reported, and discussions of misunderstandings usually serve as methodological or rhetorical strategies destined to enhance the, the authority of the individual or the discipline who spies them out. But there is much that can be done with both misunderstanding and not understanding. From a, from a most basic level, misunderstanding, with its conceptual associations with mistake, error, failure, falsity, serves conceptions of knowledge that measure validity with a standard, if not of absolute truth, then of the degree of match between representation and reality. If this measure is applied rigorously, validity becomes a matter of either or, true or false. But if we shift to a view of knowledge as a process, then it is essential for such a process and not a regrettable weakness that negativity be involved all along the way. I think this view resonates rather well with the intention stated in Professor Lopez's earlier and controversial, perhaps due to the misreadings of some of its readers, curators of the Buddha, where he cited a well-put passage from Bourdieu's assessment of colonial scholarship on Algeria, and it goes like this. Those who nowadays set themselves, themselves up as judges and distribute praise and blame among the sociologists and ethnologists of the colonial past would be better occupied in trying to understand what it was that prevented the most lucid and the best intentioned of those they condemn from understanding things which are now self-evident for even the least lucid and sometimes the least well-intentioned observers. In what is unthinkable at a given time, there is not only everything that cannot be thought for lack of ethical or political dispositions which tend to bring it into consideration, but also everything which cannot be thought of uh, thought for lack of instruments of thought, such as problematic concepts, methods, and techniques, end of quote. In his coda to this passage, Professor Lopez then remarked that the work of curators is not meant to apportion praise or blame, condemning some for their Orientalism while praising, praising others for their sympathy, judging the patriarchs against the standards of another time beyond which we have all evolved. The question is not one of how knowledge is tainted, but of how knowledge takes form, end of quote. Since the other James, uh, James Simpson, who was supposed to be delivering this response today and was unable to be here, 
Perhaps uh, I can invoke him here as a way to bring him into dialogue with Professor Lopez's work, since Professor Simpson has been an articulate voice for a view that resists looking only to the medieval past or other places such as Afghanistan as a site for iconoclasm, but that it is still present among us. He writes, a second form of metaphorical enlightenment iconoclasm applies to the much larger field of the human sciences. Different enlightenment traditions exercise a philosophical iconoclasm, such as practicing historiography by detecting enthrallment, superstition, and error. The entire past becomes a museum of error, a museum of artifacts now observed with condescension by an age advanced to the highest degree of refinement." End of quote. Some have taken it as their responsibility to become the iconoclast themselves and target not the original idols, but uh, rather the idols erroneously erected by the previous generation of failed iconoclasts. Professor Lopez in these lectures seems to be making a new move, and I think from that in curators, by going back to the 16th and 18th centuries, and rather than decrying the wayward ways of missionaries, he seems to be seeing something important in their works for thinking about how knowledge of Buddhism took form, as much as he is taking them seriously as keen observers who, although they may have been bent on iconoclasm and issuing critiques of idolatry, turned out to have preserved much of tremendous interest. If I have understood Professor Lopez correctly, it seems that misunderstandings can be useful once one situates them into a context, and once that is done, we can learn from them. Levi-Strauss seems to have been correct in his claim that, quote, virtual image, ca images can indeed cast real shadows. Think here of the shifting cases of Devadatta, or how a misunderstanding can have a real consequences. And there's one recent example, not to be too flippant here, of a case of a, uh, that probably all the Tibetologists know, of a British woman who strolled into Lhasa wearing a t-shirt with the image of Phil Silvers as Sergeant Bilko, and was arrested for wearing an image of the Dalai Lama. One of the main things I've learned pr from Professor Lopez's erudite lecture is that there have been many Western discoveries of Buddhism. There was the discovery of the Buddha as a person, the, Bu the Buddha as an idol, Buddhist art, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhism as a religion, and along the way, there have also been some serious misunderstandings and mistaken identities. In the wonderful cases discussed today by Professor Lopez, we can see that things sometimes go right when they go wrong, or at least when we focus our attention on misunderstandings, that indirection can have its compensations. I hope in closing that I've not misunderstood too dramatically the meaning and import of his thought-provoking lecture, and if I have, that it's a productive misunderstanding. Thank you very much.